Okay, and so that's what happens when you have a non-orthogonal um, hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay. Okay, so those are the two kinds. Okay, um, uh, and that's that's uh, you know that that's the most complex geometry I'm going to teach. But you can see how paraboloids and hyperboloids are all over this shape, um, hyperbolic paraboloids, um, which I'm sure is where the name came from, right? Um, but the interesting thing is like, okay, so what does it have to do with fact and constraint design? Well, um, of course, because it's a double ruled surface, um, you might notice that, you know, if one set of the lines on one ruling were constraint lines, and the other set, you know, so, so, so say here's, instead of these being just arbitrary gray lines, say they're now blue pure force wrench vectors, and their axis is this dotted thing, and they're, you know, they're like, as they're translating, they're rotating on there. And then the other set are red rotation lines that start right here, and their axis is here, and they rotate through there. Well, then you'll notice the, the question is, does every red line intersect every blue line somewhere at least once? Because if that's true, it satisfies the rule of complementary patterns. And we know one set will be blue and one set will be red. And it's absolutely true. So you can think about it. This line intersects this blue one there, this blue one there, this one blue one there, this Every single blue one in the entire thing. And that's true of every red line and true of every blue line. Okay, so anytime you have a double ruled surface, um, it's going to be a freedom and constraint space, a complementary freedom and constraint space. Now again, I showed them on top of each other as all freedom and constraint spaces should be, but here I've separated them just for visual clarity. And by the way, remember, constraint spaces just have blue lines, but freedom spaces have red lines and screws and uh, hoops, with, which are, you know, I, I suppose red, but, but they represent translations. Um, so so the, the red one looks a little different. It's hy hyperbolic probably is the same, but it has a translation that will point along the axis um, that the blue ones rotate. And of course, and then this is the case if it's an orthogonal um, hy hyperbolic paraboloid, right? So if it's orthogonal, then the planes that these guys are um, advancing on as they're twisting, uh, those planes are 90 degrees. And so, of course, if they're on parallel planes uh, that are 90 degrees in the axis, they'll all intersect a hoop that uh, has a translation that points along that axis. Okay? If it's a non-orthogonal thing, then, then that hoop, there'll still be a hoop, that, that uh, is, you know, uh, intersected by all the parallel planes, the blue lines, it just won't point along that axis. It'll point in the direction that is perpendicular to all those planes, okay? But this is drawn for an orthogonal one, okay? But anyway, the point is, we have red and green, or sorry, <laughs> we have red and blue, and then we have a hoop, and then there is a bunch of screws in there. Um, but again, we're not talking about that yet, okay? So, so just really quickly then here, um, Hyperbolic parabola, paraboloids are uh, found all over the place. Um, they're used in architecture, okay? Um, uh, one, they're very decorative, so they look pretty, and you, you become a famous architect if you use weird roofs and stuff. Um, you know, so they look nice, but they're also structurally sound, right? Because uh, they're constructed of straight lines, and the most efficient way to transfer a load is, is through, you know, you got two points through, through a, a straight line there. So. So they're, they're structurally very sound, um, and, and you can get really cool curved shapes without having to curve things. So you know, if you if you had to pattern this this curved surface, it would be very difficult. But um, you know, if you just can get straight beams and lay them down in a particular way, then you can get a curved surface, but really get it through straight lines. That makes construction much easier. Um, so it, it's found in roofs and and. Um, it's, uh, you know, I don't know how rigorous, but it's found in Pringle uh, chips here. Um, and, of course, the reason is, is well, one, it makes for a, a nice stacking shape. Um, but uh, so, so you can, you know, get a lot more chips in a, a tight space, of course, to be more compact. But, but it's also really because they're, they're stronger. Uh, you know, other, other chips of arbitrary shapes, um, they can break in the bag as they're, they're played around with. But... Uh, they're stronger for this reason that they're structurally sound and there's straight line load paths going through them, right? So, um, so that, that's another reason. Um, 
And then uh, fabric, if you tend to pull fabric in different directions, it tends to, um, you know, depending if you pull it up and down, it tends to form these saddle shapes. And then, um, you know, uh, origami, I encourage you to look up uh, origami hyperbolic paraboloid videos on YouTube. If you just get a single sheet of rectangular paper and fold square creases kind of in it, um, what you're doing is you're bending, uh, you're, you're basically putting stiffness in the crease and, and they kind of act like the, those, those straight lines uh, that, that make up the two rulings of the, uh, you know, here's one ruling you can kind of see there and there's another uh, ruling, another set of, of straight lines and magically the, as you fold this, the, it stops being a square, it starts popping up being a hyperbolic paraboloid and it's actually really cool because you can pop it, it's, it's bistable, it's stable in this configuration, you can grab its ends and twist it and pop it in the other configuration. So I, I encourage you to look up a YouTube video and maybe make one for fun and pop it into its two configurations. It's, it's kind of a bistable mechanism as well. Um, but but that's, uh, that's a hyperbolic paraboloid. So now there's, there, I, I do warn you there's all sorts of pretender shapes out there and, and many of these probably aren't rigorously hyperbolic paraboloid and honestly I'm not sure how rigorous Pringles makes their thing mathematically perfectly hyperbolic um, or if they're just like well let's just do a saddle but there are other kinds of saddles not to be confused with hyperbolic paraboloids um, you know if you and any and some people get this wrong you know if you go into science museums and um, they have certain shapes that if you dip in soap films they'll, they'll make these really cool soap film shapes and if you have something like this and you dip it in soap, it'll make a saddle shape um, that's, that's called, it's, it's a minimal surface. You're, you're basically, you know, because of surface tension and, and the way nature is set up, uh, you know, the, the soap film will always try and uh, minimize the surface area that needs to be made to connect everything. And so, um, and what that ends up meaning is that at every point on this, uh, it's got principal axes and the curvatures uh, basically uh, cancel each other, it's like basically, uh, you know, the, the curvatures cancel each other out to make the, this minimal shape. But, but it, so anyway, um, I don't want to get too much into that, but, but a lot of people will say this is a hyperbolic paraboloid and it approximates one. It's, it's very similar to one, um, but it's it, mathematically, this minimal surface is slightly different uh, than a hyperbolic paraboloid. And if you, you know, it, it uses different equations, much more complex equations to, to model this than the hyperbolic paraboloid, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's close. So you might, you might see a lot of people saying this is a hyperbolic paraboloid. Now you can correct them and say it's approximate, but it's, it's not exact, okay? Um, th there's entire museums dedicated to these, these shapes I'm, I'm showing you. Like this is a sculpture. I, th I think this is from a museum in Brazil. Uh, one of my students sent it to me, took, took pictures of it. But um, you can see they, they've, you know, each of these little building blocks is, is uh, something that's basically like those gray lines that are translated along there as they rotate and uh, that's making that curved surface and then they stack it all in the statue so the, these are um, I, I mean I hope the artist made that ratio of rotation per translation to be a hyperbolic paraboloid but anyway it's, it, this may be approximate too um, but uh, yeah not everything that's a saddle um, is uh, a hyperbolic paraboloid that's that's one thing to to know Okay, because hyperbolic probably is a very specific mathematical shape. And if you want the equation, it's in my uh, master's thesis and on, online and everything. Okay, so, and you can see uh, this, is, this is the freedom constraint space. Here you see that there's the constraint space, there's the freedom space, you can see the black arrow in there. And then for a, an orthogonal one, uh, you can see there's, there's like disks of green screws that are collinear with one of these axes. But anyway, you don't need, really need to know that, but that, that's, there's some screws in there is the bottom line. And they're not as clean as this if it becomes an or, a non-orthogonal one. Um, okay, but, but there, these shapes are, this isn't just the only one that has hyperbolic paraboloids. There's tons of hyperbolic paraboloids all over this chart. Like for instance, if you take this shape and stack it on top of itself like Pringle chips kind of, and then rotate on the side, it's, it's this one, this shape right here. Um, within this shape, there's hyperbolic paraboloids that are rotating through there. Uh, you know, uh, let's see, this shape has hyperbolic paraboloids in it. So anyway, hyperbolic paraboloids are all over this. If you understand the math, they're, they're kind of hidden within these shapes. Okay, and with that, um, I'm going to take a quick break before we go on to the next topic.